How about today we tell a little story? Does that sound good? Hey, everybody, it's Todd. Before we get started, I should tell you that this started out as a safety moment, and I started telling the story, and it got way, 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 way out of control. It's way longer than a safety moment. So what you're about to hear is really either the longest safety moment in the world or maybe one of the best conversations that I've ever had with myself about this topic. I think you'll enjoy it immensely. All's well here. I hope you're doing great. This story should make you happy. In fact, if if no other story brightens your day, this will be the one. This makes me glad that we're alive, and it makes me glad people are around to actually do these things. Learning from workers, correctly identifying the problem, and then reaching out for the solution, man, it doesn't get a lot sexier than that. So without any further ado, what was going to be a safety moment, which now turned into a full-blown podcast, here you go. Let's talk about a hand safety, but let's act like it's really a safety moment. So sit back and relax. You're going to enjoy this immensely. Here we go. Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Pre-Accident Investigation Safety Moment. I'm your lovely host, Todd Conklin. How are you today? So today I'm going to tell a story about hand safety. It's a story you've heard a lot because um, we talk about hand safety a lot. And you know that I know that you know that I know that you know that I think hand safety is almost never about hands. But today, I have a story that proves it. So this story comes from the guys uh, that work for a major automotive company that has a relationship with the Automotive Workers Union. I'm trying not to use names. Can you tell? And they get together and talk about worker safety and they're amazing at it. And they were really challenged by the fact that one of the problems that has drifted into the system, especially in heavy manufacturing like this, is finger amputations. Now, I will just tell you that there's no reason on earth to ever cut off somebody's finger. I, I just can't, even if you're a despot, which is a word I like to use, a, a wicked evil dictator, you still shouldn't cut off people's fingers because it's horrible. It's it's awful. It, it's terrible. It's a serious injury. It's not life-threatening. I mean, I guess it could be, but for the most part, it's not. It's just an awful thing to do. And they were cutting off kind of more fingers than they were comfortable with, and historically, they'd been cutting off a lot more fingers than they were comfortable with, and there was a reason for it. Now, initially, I think their thought was, that the workers simply weren't paying attention. They got complacent. They didn't care enough. If you cared more, you wouldn't get your finger cut off. I mean, you know that. Workers that care don't get their finger amputated. But I pushed them on that pretty hard. And, in fact, that push was pretty uncomfortable. I often tell the story of the old worker who told me, I learned early on in my career in the oil patch that every hand injury was a function of the material we make people move. Well, that story is pretty poignant to me. It changed the way I thought about hand safety, and that was years ago. Now, these guys use mm, kind of, I, I would call them nut drivers, but they've changed a lot. Initially, when they first started this, I'm sure they built cars with wrenches, you know, so it was all manual labor, uh, 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 pull on that wrench. But then they brought in air-powered tools, and air-powered tools were remarkable. I mean, it made the process more efficient. I'm sure it made it more accurate. It probably did it better than a human could do it alone. And those air-powered tools worked great. The only problem is, is you had to have a lot of air hoses draped all over creation and back in order to put the cars together. So eventually they went to electric nut drivers, and electric nut drivers were great as well, AC electric nut drivers. And they did a good job. They were fine. You didn't have the uh, the air problem anymore. You didn't have the hoses. You just replaced air hoses, which leaked and oftentimes would get cut, with power cords that you could bring in from the ceiling. That seemed better. And then progress happened. And we introduced into our system, you know it, you have it. If I went to your shop, you'd have one right now. Those 24-volt DC tools. So now we've gone from a pneumatic tool to an AC tool to a DC tool. And the thing that's changed on this journey is not the type of cords or hoses that are drug across the plant floor, although those changed. What's changed 
is torque. You want me to say that again? Because I never use technical terms like this. It feels good kind of torque. In fact, a DC nut driver has got a lot of torque. An AC nut driver is fast, but a DC nut driver is strong. And they're all stronger than a pneumatic tool. And as torque increased and as production pressure increased and as operational complexities, manufacturing complexities increased, what happened is, is that the tolerance for finger injuries increased right along with it, pretty much at the same rate of speed. If, you were, if you're going to draw some curves, you could probably have the curve of the effectiveness of the tool. Right next to it would be another different colored line that would be the curve of the number of amputations and degloving events. And what's so interesting about this little story I'm telling you is that they started to actually damage more hands. And the damage was pretty serious. So it could be a full-blown amputation, although that'd be pretty rare. What it really is is the degloving. And there was so much torque on these nut drives. Get ready. This is going to kind of gross you out. That oftentimes it would pull the tendon off the elbow, pull the tendon through the arm, and wrap it around the ratchet on the nut driver. These are pretty horrific events. And this team of people, gosh, they're great. Let's just make up some names for them. Let's call them Rob and Sean and Mark. And there, there's even a lot more, but those are kind of my made-up names for them. They got together and said, can we apply the new view thinking to this old view problem? Can we say for a moment that a worker has to drive nuts into a manufacturing environment. They're putting doors on the side of a truck, a pickup truck. Let's say they have to do that 23,000 times a year. And if they do it 23,000 times a year, it's a pretty good bet that not all 23,000 iterations of that task will be perfect. In fact, if you're a quality person, a, a lean thinking person, you could probably calculate pretty effectively what the failure rate is on that just on the quality of the nut driven in. So how many are going to cross thread? How many are going to be forgotten? Well, you could also calculate the number of fingers that were involved in a degloving event. And so they started thinking about putting covers on the tools. And that was a good idea because covers on the tools weren't attached to the ratchet. They actually kind of floated along. You could make them orange. And you made it kind of hard to get your hand in there. And that's always good. If you can make it hard to get hurt and easy to not get hurt, for the most part, that's going to work. But there was one interface that they couldn't really tackle. And that's where the nut driver hit the bolt. That's the one place where you couldn't put a cover because you don't want to make it harder to use a nut driver. You want to make it easy to use the nut driver because quality matters. So that little danger zone that became the critical task, or, or at least that part of that job became the critical part of that activity. And they started thinking, maybe it's not the hands. Hmm. Yeah, maybe it isn't the hands. Maybe the hands aren't the, hmm. Let's get gloves with orange tips on them. That way the worker doesn't really fall for the old complacency problem. In fact, they'll know right where the tip of their finger is. And those orange tips will actually make us safer. And they tried that. And it didn't seem to work very well. Because orange tips are great. I'm all in favor of orange tips. The problem is, is I'm not sure the problem was the hand. I don't know if you figured it out by now. I think the problem probably is that one part of the interface that you can't cover that has to be open, that needs to be available, needs to be efficient, and it's the place where the nut driver hits the nut. So they started thinking, wow, huh. Are gloves even the right thing? Because gloves and rotating tools, generally speaking, are enemies, except that if you're manufacturing things that are made of steel, you really want the cut protection. And quite honestly, if you do this work very long at all, you realize the gloves are actually not only pretty safety-minded, they're also kind of comfort-minded, and your hands are cleaner and smoother and not nicked up and burred when you get off on the shift. So they said, well, maybe, maybe we should think differently about this problem. And what they did was pretty remarkable. They said, is it possible that we can make a glove that has a tearaway finger? In fact, is it possible that we can make a glove 
that has all tearaway fingers, thumb and four fingers, if the glove tip gets caught between the ratchet and the nut, it would actually pull the glove off the finger, but it would not pull the finger with it. In fact, what it would do is it would provide sort of an escape route for the finger. You know what it buys is time. Now, you've heard me say this a bunch. What we manage is not accidents. In fact, I would suggest you could guarantee if you drive 21,000 nuts a year that somebody's going to get their finger caught. That's not even very interesting. And the ability to believe that we can do that perfectly, that's crazy talk. That's no, there's no way that's going to be the case. So if you can't actually manage the accident, why don't you just assume the accident's going to happen and build capacity in the system so that you can fail and fail safely? This is a really interesting idea. It's like boots in an aluminum smelting plant that are able to handle the temperature of smelted aluminum. Not for a long time, but long enough so I could accidentally put my foot in and then, for goodness sakes, have the time to pull my foot back out before it gets burned. Let's make gloves with tearaway fingers. And so they called the glove guys because they're a big, big organization and UAW is gigantic. And they said, hey, glove guys, can you take your R&D people and design for us a set of gloves, both Kevlar and then the kind of the, the, the grippy kind? Uh, I'm sure these have names. I just don't know what they're called. Can you give us some prototypes, some micro experiments of these gloves with tearaway fingers? And the glove company said, ready for this? Sure. You're the customer and you buy a lot of gloves. We want you to be happy. And this could be an entirely new line of gloves we could sell that are still made with the glove machine, but it's another product. We'll try it. And they designed some and they tested them and they prototyped them. And it was amazing. Where once a plant could pretty much count on six finger amputations a year, the plant where they went out and prototyped these new gloves had zero finger amputations a year. Now, they got some cuts and some scrapes and some burrs because that's still a rotating tool next to a finger. But you guys, I don't know how you feel, but I would trade a cut or a scrape or a burr in fact, I would trade hundreds of cuts or scrapes or burrs for a degloving event. So the gloves were made, and the gloves are out there, and you don't even have to look very far to find them. In fact, if I can, on this podcast, I'll even try to put a picture so you can see what these tearaway gloves look like. And that story is really important for us, but not because the tearaway gloves are a really cool idea. And it probably changes the industry. And it clearly changes rotating tool safety. That's a great outcome. That's a brilliant outcome. But to me, what's interesting about this is the story of the thinking that got a group of people to get together and challenge the normal assumptions. A good worker would be more careful with his hands with a new idea that says the accident's going to happen, and when it does, how can we build capacity into that system? That part of the story is much, much more interesting. In fact, that part of the story is everything. That's why we're here, to have that conversation. And I can't say enough about how proud I am of those guys, but it's not me. I can't say enough about how brilliant their solution is, it's just a pair of gloves that have rip away fingers. What I can say a lot about is the thinking process that changed to get them to a solution that made sense. And what's funny is I'm telling you this story because they didn't even think of it as a story to tell. In fact, when I said to them, God, this is amazing. Who knows about this? This is a story. This should be at the ASSE meeting. This ought to be at every hand safety seminar. You ought to be publishing this. They said, we didn't think of it that way. In fact, what they said is the solution just made sense. It didn't seem like a new idea. It seemed like a way to solve a problem. And here's what I'm going to tell you. Good solutions feel exactly like that. 
They're not giant ideas that you can put on the side of a dirigible. I'm using good vocabulary today. Have you noticed that? And float across the football game. They just make sense. And the workers, oddly enough, because they were engaged and involved in prototyping and discussion and problem identification and problem solution, the workers actually thought the gloves were a great idea. And at first they said, yeah, this is kind of weird. Who makes gloves with rip-off fingers until events started happening? And everybody kind of understood, oh, that's why they make gloves with rip-off fingers. And the diffusion of those gloves, well, you know, that's just going to happen. That's a, if it's a good idea, people will build a path to a better mousetrap. What's amazing is that the bean counters initially thought the gloves were expensive, and they are. They're, they're, they're at least twice, in fact, in the Kevlar version, three times what a normal pair of glove costs. The interesting thing about that is I did a little calculation on the back of a napkin. And here's what a degloving costs your company. So the surgery to recover from that degloving event is between $20,000 and $60,000. And depending on what finger the worker loses, let's go with thumb and index finger. Those are the two big high value ones. Recovery periods between 40 and 60 weeks. So let's just kind of Let's kind of calculate that. Let's say $60,000 for the surgery, because I don't know about you, but medical stuff always costs way more than I think it does. And let's make it an index finger. Let's make it 50 weeks. Now we're at $60,000 plus $200,000. We're now, or sorry, $150,000, which takes us to $210,000. So bean counters, how many gloves can you buy or $210,000? Giving you some time to answer that because you're counting beans right now. The answer, mathematically, is a crap load. You can buy an awful lot of gloves for $210,000. That's how I challenge you to think of problem solving. In fact, what I'd tell you is, I'll bet you there's a ton of stories like this. In fact, I bet all these stories that we want to learn from so desperately, they may not even be out there because what's interesting about this is that in fact, I would suggest the answer made so much sense. They didn't even realize it was probably earth shattering, life changing paradigm shifting. It was maybe a great answer. And your guys can have these gloves too, because they didn't hog the information they didn't own the information. They created the solution to solve the problem for everybody, no matter who you build for or what you build. If you're using rotating tools and you have the potential to have a degloving event, perhaps, perhaps, perhaps these gloves make sense. So is there a downside to this? Yeah. There are people who are listening to this right now who are thinking, yeah, it's a great idea, but now the workers are even going to pay less attention. Well, here's what I'm going to tell you. Every safeguard you put into a system brings with it its own, very own brand new set of hazards. And because the gloves rip away, maybe I will start to use that as a production advantage. Maybe I won't pay enough attention. But the, dr the, 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 the drugs, that was a Freudian slip, the gloves have the ability to manage a mistake or a violation. In fact, the tearaway part of those gloves don't stand in moral judgment of the worker. They just work. So if you want to push back and tell me it'll make your workers lazy, my answer is, yeah, but asking them to care more is really a fool's goal. It won't work either. We want to build systems that don't manage accidents. That's not that important to us. We want to build systems that, in fact, manage the consequence that will happen. It's not if a worker gets their finger caught between the nut driver and the nut. It's when a worker gets its finger caught between the nut driver and a nut. That's the story. Is there more? You bet. Do you want to talk to these guys? Hit me up. In fact, I'm going to try to do a whole podcast interview with them. Because I think them telling you the story is even better than my, when I tell you the story. But it's the kind of story that I, I just can't imagine not telling you. Because I think it's a story that has real value pretty much all the way across. 
I had no idea it would take this long to tell this story. So probably by this point in time, I've made a decision. We'll see what happens that this goes from a safety moment podcast, the little short and sweet ones to maybe a longer podcast. So you can have some time to think about it. The challenge is, is that these fine, fine folks created a way to solve a problem that they had that was just not acceptable. Cutting off someone's finger is not acceptable. And the way they did it was to create a system that in fact has the capacity to buy those workers time, time when they need it most, time right when that period happens where the fingertip and the ratchet and the nut all are combined and somebody hits the switch on that 24-volt DC nut driver with tons and tons of torque. It's the combination of the work, the worker, and the technology that make this problem complex. And they didn't simplify the problem. They actually made the solution very transparent. That difference is huge. And that is the story that I think we should tell each other. So that's the story of hand safety that we're telling today. That's the story of hand safety that if I read the tea leaves correctly, is going to change hand safety for rotating tools in heavy manufacturing probably from today forward. The guys that came up with this idea should be proud. The people who diffuse this idea and use it in their facilities should be relieved. And all of us should be happy that now there will be more guitar players and banjo players and mandolin players and piano players in the world because of tearaway gloves. That's our safety moment for today. 21 minutes of safety moment for today. I hope you get what you need. Learn something new every single day. I know you did today. Have as much fun as you possibly can. And for goodness sakes, you guys, be safe.